Um, good morning, Porch Community. It's great to see you. Welcome to the Grossheims and the Ubers. We're really glad that you guys are a part of uh, our family. As Josh said, it's always a great day. And not only do we welcome in new ministry partners today, but we're also uh, baptizing uh, a young man, uh, Cody. Where, where's Cody? Oh, there you are. Hey, bud, you're right in front of me. Cody Alonzo. So we're going to be uh, celebrating that baptism just a little bit later in the service. And I love it. All your friends are up here on the front row with you. So, um, so we are, as I said about the video, we're concluding today this series we've been doing in the book of Numbers. We've been going through it, and, and if, I, if I had to, and it's really kind of hard, Justin, I was thinking about this, if I had to sum up the overarching theme of Numbers, I, right now, <laughs> ask me tomorrow, it might be different, but I think um, it would be something to the effect of, of it showing how God's mercy and God's graciousness sustained his people while they're in the wilderness. That he is this sustaining God because he's, he's the only thing that sustained them. I mean, you think about the physical, like, yes, he provided manna, right? That seed that they could make into bread. He provided manna for them when they were hungry, sure. He provided even quail for them when they were tired of the manna. He provided water for them. He, he provided like the material things that you and I need to survive. But, but the real thing that sustained them was his grace, his mercy upon them, which actually I would say just brings us right to the very first porch point this morning. And it's this, God's, and so this is for us too, not just right here in numbers, but God's grace sustains his people. God's grace sustains us. Yes, we need you know, the, the, the roof over our head and, and protection from the elements and we need sustenance to stay alive and we need water, but it's God's grace that sustains us. And here's why I, would, I say this um, about God's grace and it being this constant is because, just a very quick overview, quick, 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 um, if you go to, if you, you don't have to turn there, but in Numbers 11 and in Numbers 21, what we see is this repeated disobedience and grumbling of God's people, just, just repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. In, in chapter 14, you see where they refused. It was, they could have gone on into the land that he had for them, and they refused to go because of fear. They didn't go. So, but God's grace still sustained them. And then a few chapters later, in number 16, it's like, oh, no, no, now we'll go. And then they defied Moses and Aaron. So there's this repeated, like, inability for them to, to uh, obey God, and yet he is continually gracious to them, merciful to them, and it's what kept them alive. And then you get to chapter 25, and there's this, just this immorality that sweeps through the camp and, and this worshiping of idols, and it's just a horrible uh, moment in the life of Israel, and 23,000 are, are killed because of their disobedience to God. Yet still, his graciousness and his faithfulness to them, the, his, his mercy is seen through this. So I, I would say that despite all the, all the God's grace, despite all that, God's grace sustained them, even when the primary characteristic, and this is for us to hear, even when the primary characteristic of the Israelites is their grumbling disobedience. And that's an application point for you and me, right? Even when our primary characteristic can be one of complaining, one of ungratefulness, uh, even in disobedience, God is still merciful. God is still gracious to us. So there's this glaring contrast that you find in the book of Numbers between the grace and the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, and the unfaithfulness of his people. And here's where we go. And Justin, really, he was steering us this way last week. He set the stage very well for us to see this. Because a sad, yet nonetheless necessary part of the story comes in Numbers chapter 27. In Numbers 27, and that's where our text is this morning. Israel is finally getting very near to being able to go into the promised land. Finally able to go. And this interaction occurs between God and Moses 
And in verse 12, God says to Moses, climb one of the mountains east of the river and look out over the land I have given the people of Israel. And after you have seen it, you will die like your brother Aaron. For you both rebelled against my instructions in the wilderness of Zen. When the people of Israel rebelled, you failed to demonstrate my holiness to them at the waters. The waters. So Moses, okay, you're going, hang on, Shane, you talked about graciousness and, and uh, mercy, and now he just told Moses he's going to die He's allowing Moses to see with his eyes the promise that he made to Moses. He's giving him that. This didn't just occur. Moses didn't just that moment before choose to, to disobey God. It had been a minute. And it's so there his graciousness and mercy is even Moses is still around. And now he's allowing him to see the promise that God made to him. It's going to be fulfilled. But he tells Moses, because you rebelled, because you did not keep my word, because you did not obey, you're not going in. You're not going in. So Moses isn't going into the promised land. He, he, I read somewhere, and I can't remember where it was, but it's always stuck with me in regard to this. Um, Moses didn't put weight to God's words. We're, we're going to look at the text in a second. But Moses failed to put weight to what God told him to do, the detail of God's word. Two similar events occur. Justin mentioned them last week. The first one happens in Exodus 17. Because remember what God said here in 27. He goes, because you failed to demonstrate my holiness to them at the waters. Well, what happened at the waters? Well, the first is in Exodus 17 in verse 5 and 6. Um. Israel had just come out of Egypt. They were, guess what's happening? Guess what? They were grumbling and complaining. Who knew? They were grumbling and complaining that there's no water. And on this first event, God wants to show them, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to provide for you. And so here's what happens in uh, Exodus 17, starting in verse 5. He says to Moses, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. Remember what happened there? Okay, the waters parted. Okay, take that staff that you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. Take the, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. So Moses did what God asked him to do. So that's not rebellion. That's not the moment. That can't be where he messed up. He did exactly what God told him to do. There are actually biblical scholars, many of them, who say that this is one of many foreshadowing of, of Jesus Christ. That, that God instructing Moses to strike the rock once is this foreshadowing of Jesus being struck and crucified once. And from it flows living waters. So Exodus 17 is this first event of, of Moses, his staff, a rock, and water coming forth. And in that one, Moses, he does it. He does it right. Now, the second event is what we looked at last week in Numbers 20. And this time, God, he's very explicit. He says, I don't want you to strike the rock this time. We did that before. The people were thirsty. For some reason, the people who knew that water would be provided are thirsty again, and they're complaining and grumbling again about the fact that they don't have water in that moment, as if God's not going to provide for them this time. And Moses, like I think any of us would be, was fed up. And so he, God tells him what to do. He gives them instruction again. And in Numbers 20, this time he says, don't strike the rock. Don't strike the rock. I want you to simply speak to it. There's this lesson in here, folks. Because they go, oh, it must be the staff. It must be the staff that did that, right? Let's, let's lift up the staff. Oh, no, it must be Moses. He's the guy that's holding the staff. He did one time and the waters parted. He struck a rock another time and the rock brings forth water. It must be Moses, but here we are thirsty. Moses, give us water. God's like, no, I want to teach you a lesson. Moses is not the one providing for you. I am. 
Moses is working for me. I'm speaking through him. But Moses in his humanness and fed upness, there's a word, is like he doesn't, he doesn't lean into what God is saying. And so it's not the staff and it certainly isn't Moses. God's like, I just want you to speak to the rock and it'll bring forth water. I'm going to show, I'm going to continue, continually teach my people that I will provide for them. God was always teaching. Did you know that God is always teaching? Did you know he's always teaching you? Like right now, not because I'm talking to you, but like on the drive here, God's teaching. On the drive home, God's teaching. Tomorrow, he'll be teaching. He's always at work. He is continually teaching, and he wants to do something different here. Just speak to the rock, Moses. Just speak to it, and the water will bring forth living water for them. He's showing them, I'm the one that provides. But Moses, he didn't. He didn't. We don't know why. Just made a really good point. He's like, you know what? He, he, he was going with what he knew. Maybe in that moment, he just, he was overwhelmed. Maybe he was just so fed up. Maybe he was so frustrated. Maybe just the, the weight, the burden of that leadership. And people continually going, always complaining, always grumbling. But it wasn't the message God wanted to deliver. He didn't want Moses to strike the rock. And Moses didn't strike it just once. He struck it twice. This wasn't the message for God's people that God wanted to deliver, which is why God says to Moses, you didn't trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel. You will not lead them into the land that I'm giving them. That had to be devastating. Which brings us back to Numbers 27. Because now God is reminding Moses, here is the land, but you're not going to go into it. And this, again, is a teaching moment. It's a teaching moment for Israel. It's a teaching moment for us because Moses' failure teaches us that no one, no one is above God's word. No one. Not even the greatest of prophets, the greatest of leaders. No one. You said it last week, Justin, that it was one of the points, one of the porch points you made, that that Moses' failure to obey God is a stark reminder that our actions have consequences. And and Moses is living this out, his consequences. However, and I I do believe this is part of, of God's greater plan. This is part of God's graciousness. This is part of God's mercy in action right here. Because Moses' failure does something else. It sets the stage. And it's something that we should take note of. It shows God's sovereignty, his graciousness, his faithfulness in continuing his promise to Israel despite the failure of its leader. He's still faithful to them. He is still faithful to his promise, his end of the deal. He is faithful to this. And so this moment in Numbers 27 where God shows the promised land to Moses, he's like, go up on this mountain, let's look out on this together. He shows this to him, but he says, you can't go in. And it is a majestic and a heartbreaking moment all at the same time. I mean, imagine seeing the promised land, but then knowing you cannot go in. I think about that. I think about that reality on this side of of history. And I think about the number of people who, for whatever reason, and there's many reasons, they've heard the information They've, they've been told, maybe they grew up in church or they've, they've, they've just been around long enough. They've been around other believers and other people long enough where they've received information about this Jesus Christ person and, and something about being a savior, a messiah, a 
something about sins being forgiven, something about eternal life. And it's like we've got these components of information. And it's like it sounds good. Like, oh, what, you mean I don't, I, I can have eternal life? Like eternal life, like not in a, not in, in like hell, not separated, but like in the presence of, of God? Like, you know, you get that kind of information, right? We just holding all this stuff. And I think there's a lot of people, and it's like we've walked up the, the, the mountaintop there, And we're holding all this information and we're looking out into the promised land. We're looking out into what the promises of God are. And and we're like, oh, yeah, but I can't get to the other side. Like, there's just too much. I I can't do it. And, And the truth is, the reality is, you're right. You cannot. Just like Moses could not. There was a whole generation of people who did not go into the promised land because they did not listen to God's word. They did not understand his mercy and his graciousness to them. And they chose repeatedly, repeatedly to disobey, to disobey, and to go against him. By this time in the book of Numbers, I don't know, you remember we said it's like an 11-week trip from leaving Egypt to going into the promised land. That's what it should have been, 11-day trip, I think. Excuse me. Um, But that wasn't the time. God had stuff to teach in the wilderness, right? God had things to teach them. So it wasn't ever going to be just an 11-day walking journey, ever. But it certainly shouldn't have been 40 years. And the reason was because later, after he had taught them what they needed to learn, they kept disobeying. So a whole generation, God's like, you're not going in. But I'm going to be gracious, and I'm going to be merciful to my promise to the people of Israel. But some of you aren't going in. And I go back to that image of people now in today's time who, who have information about God, who are standing there going, well, there's the promise land, but, but I, I, don't, I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to get there. And, and you're right. We need somebody to bring us in to the promised land. We need it. We need somebody. If Moses failed, friends, we're going to fail. If God's chosen person to lead his people are going to fail, we are going to fail. We have failed. We failed today. Porch point number two. Moses' mistake magnifies the Messiah. Jesus is the better Moses. That's what Justin said last week. Moses' mistake magnifies the need for a Messiah. Otherwise, we're standing up on that hilltop with Moses going, I can't go in. I can't. There's too much of grumbling and complaining and disobedience and choosing self over you, God. I cannot go in. I do not deserve to go in. And you're right. But Moses' imperfection highlights the perfection of Jesus as Messiah. So I love this about our God is because he took even this moment, this heartbreaking moment for Moses, And he still uses it for his glory. It's how he works. You have stories, heartbreaking stories, of how God has still brought glory to himself. Jesus fulfills all that Moses foreshadowed. I don't even know if Moses, Moses didn't even know he was foreshadowing the coming Messiah. But he, for, Jesus fulfills all that Moses foreshadowed. He, he being, he's the ultimate mediator, the perfect Savior. In the Gospel of Luke, you don't have to turn there, it'll be on the screen, but in Luke chapter 24, 27, Jesus even says, and this is one of the reasons the Pharisees had such a hard time with him, this is why they really didn't like the guy, is because he made statements like this. In chapter 24, verse 27 of Luke, he says, or we read, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he's like, you know all these scriptures that you guys know? Guess what? They're about me. And then a little bit further down in that chapter, verse 44 
Jesus said to them, this is what I told you. This is, the, this is the risen Jesus here. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. It's the Old Testament, friends. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus says, all of that is about me. All of it is about me. All of it points to me. Moses standing on the hilltop knowing he can't go into the promised land, that points to me. Living water coming from the rock, that points to me. All of this, all the Old Testament, all the figures, all the events, all the traditions, all the symbols, they ultimately point to him, they are fulfilled in him, and they find their greater meaning in him. All of it, Jesus. So as we wrap up this this series in Numbers, specifically Moses' leadership in Numbers. I, I want to take us through remembering some specific moments where I see how Moses points to, how Moses foreshadows, he prefigures Jesus. Starting at the very beginning of his life, when Moses was a baby, Pharaoh ordered the mass killing of every Hebrew child, male child, two years and younger. Jesus, during his birth, King Herod ordered the mass killing of every Hebrew baby under the age of two. The Israelites experienced 400 years of bondage in Egypt until Moses was born and God raised him up to lead the people out of slavery. The nation of Israel later experienced 400 dark years of silence from God until Jesus was born and began his public ministry. Moses was the very first mediator between God and humanity, his people. And Jesus is the final mediator. He is the one. He's the true one. Moses, with that staff of his, they were trying to get his people out of Egypt, touched the, the waters of the Nile and turned that water into blood. Jesus, as he began his ministry, turned water into wine. All of these, this imagery. Moses initiated, he was, he was the one who initiated the first Passover lamb, right, to absorb the wrath of God that was coming on to Egypt while they were there. Jesus, who is he? He is the final, the perfect Passover lamb. He fully absorbed the wrath, not just that one time. He fully absorbed the wrath of God for sin once and for all. Through Moses, God parted the Red Sea. And it brought salvation in that moment to the Israelites out of slavery. And it's through Jesus what happens. God provides salvation out of slavery to sin and death. This is what he does for all who believe this is possible. Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. And Jesus stood there in his Sermon on the Mount. And he gave fuller understanding to those Ten Commandments. Moses carried the law and pointed to the gospel, and Jesus fulfills that law and is the gospel. We know this. Moses struck a rock, and from it flows living water. <laughs> For all who were thirsty in that moment, here's what God does. He struck a better rock And from that flows living water, quenches that spiritual thirst. Moses led his people to the promised land, but not into it because of his sin. And Jesus, the sinless one, leads his people to the better promised land. Reconciliation with God and eternity with him. That's the real promised land. See, Moses, as, as great a servant of God as he was, was merely a sign. He was a pointer. He was a shadow of the truer and greater representative for God, who is Jesus. 
Which brings me to the third porch point this morning, which is this. Jesus justifies the journey. He does. It was hard. It's difficult. There are challenges. There are times we don't know which way. There are times it feels like a wilderness more than anything else. But Jesus makes it possible. He justifies this journey. The narrative of numbers ultimately points to Jesus. Every story and symbol in the Old Testament, every single one finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. His incarnation, life, death, resurrection, all of it bring resolution to the journey that was begun right there in the wilderness. God's promise to his people fulfilled. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the, to the church. He wrote these words to the church. We're the church, right? Right? Are we the church? Okay, just checking. Wake up. He wrote these words to the church. He wrote these words to people who were actually, he, these were people living under the new covenant like you and I. And so these words are for us today as well as, as them, those in Corinth, as we consider all that God did through Moses for his people. You know, it's Memorial Day weekend, a day we remember. We remember. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 1. I'm going to read from the message. Remember our history, friends, and be warned. All our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours. As Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. They all ate and drank identical food and drink, meals provided daily by God. They drank from the rock, God's fountain for them that stayed with them wherever they were, and the rock was Christ. But just experiencing God's wonder and grace didn't seem to mean much. Most of them were defeated by temptation during hard times in the desert, and God was not pleased. The same thing could happen to us. We must be on guard so that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did. And we must not turn our religion into a circus as they did. First the people partied, then they threw a dance. We must not be sexually promiscuous. They paid for that, remember, with 23,000 deaths in one day. We must never try to get Christ to serve us instead of us serving him. They tried it, and God launched an epidemic of poisonous snakes. We must be careful not to stir up discontent. Discontent destroyed them. These are all warning markers, danger in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You are not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useful. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. And that is a promise for God's people who believe in and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Would you pray with me? Father, as we stand on that hilltop and we look out on what, we, what we're told is a promise from you and we're told it's good things, I pray, God, that we walk not in our confidence, but with the confidence of Jesus Christ, we walk into the promised land. Lord, and we, we know that we don't go in as perfection. We don't. We go in because of the perfection of Jesus Christ. We go in because he absorbed the wrath. He took our place. Lord, I thank you that you are gracious to us, that you are merciful to us. And I pray, Father, that as we go about our days, we are submitted, surrendered, to your purposes and to your ways, that we do not take your word lightly, that we lean into it, that we, that we wanna know you better so we get in your word to know you better. And when you call us to move, to stay, to go, to speak, to not speak, to strike the rock or not, where we would know your voice and we would be obedient to you. Father, I thank you that in everything we do, everything we do, we do it in the confidence of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.